chapter 26, and beginning uh, there at verse 33, Matthew 26 and 33. It says, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Verse 34, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. We look at this this morning. And may God add his blessings to the reading of his word this morning. We look at this this morning, and, and, and it's a very familiar scripture as as Jesus told Peter that before the rooster crows, uh, he was going to deny that he even knew the Lord. And uh, we look at this this morning, and, and Peter was like, he was adamant. He was sure. He was like, no way, God. There's no way that I'm going to deny you. If, if I die, I, I would not deny you. And here it says, as uh, the scripture points out, that all the disciples said the same thing here. And, but somebody, I believe, today needs to hear the words that, that uh, lets them know that, that just simply this, Jesus loves you today. I, I pray uh, through this scripture you'll see a under, and understand that. Just like Peter and the other disciples did, uh, they thought Jesus was the Messiah. They thought that he was the one that was to restore Israel to its former glory, the kingdom, and set up his rule and reign right then at that present time. They did not see what was ahead. Just likewise, you and I today, we don't know what is ahead or what's before us. But not seeing, in their case, they did not see the suffering servant that was even prophesied in, the, in part by Isaiah that he would take away the penalty of our sin. And Isaiah reads this in chapter 53. It says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we uh, should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And, he, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and, and we esteemed him not. Surely. Uh, he hath borne our griefs and carried out our and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord 
hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus came for this purpose. Jesus came to take your place and my place for the penalty of sin. He came, this was, uh, I was preaching the other week, and, and, I, and I'll remind you again today, this was not a, a last-ditch effort. God knew before Adam and Eve was ever placed in the garden, before the earth was formed, before any of the universes uh, were formed, before the moons, the, the star, the, the sun, whatever the, what we see in the universe, before any of that was ever created, God knew that he was going to create man. And he also knew that man was going to fall. And he also knew that, that man was going to need a savior. But maybe like Peter today and the disciples, you can't see or understand what God is doing right now. Maybe you don't see, understand uh, what's going on in your world, what's going on in your life. And, and it just seems like a total wreck. I, I know I don't have all the answers. I don't understand everything. Uh, but I do know this, that Jesus has all power and he loves me. And, and, and to me, uh, uh, and, and the fact that he loves you, he loves you today. I'm sure the, the disciples were upset. Uh, they did not understand, even after being told, even after Jesus laid it out, explained it to them, he even told them, I got to go to Jerusalem. Uh, and there I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. But on the third day, I'll rise again. He explained everything that was going to happen to him, but it's just like it did not sink in. It did not uh, go where it needed to go. You know, sometimes, he, uh, just like uh, all of us, sometimes we all have a tendency to let something either go in one ear and out the other, or sometimes it uh, doesn't even get in the first ear. We, uh, we don't hear it. Uh, but this is, this is exactly where the disciples were, and Jesus told them what was coming. But they did not understand. And what happened that night? After, after, after Jesus told them what was going to happen, the night came that, that Jesus was betrayed, and he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and uh, they came to take him into custody. And this is what John tells us of what happened. Uh, you know, Judas, who had uh, met with the high priest and, and, the, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees to betray Jesus, uh, he'd already got his 30 pieces of silver, and he'd done told them he was going to point out who Jesus was. So it says in, in, in John 18 and 2, it says, And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. Talking about the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, for Jesus oft times resorted there with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And Jesus, therefore, knowing all that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? And I want you to catch this real quick here, what I'm about to tell you here uh, today. It says, they answer him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon then, as he had said unto them, talking about Jesus, I am he. The scripture bears out here. He said, they, it says, they went backward. And it said, and they fell to the ground. Then asked them, he them again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I want you to see something. The disciples, after this, they fled. They were dazed. They were confused. Their focus was on the situation and not on the one who was in control the whole time. I want you to see, notice when Jesus answered their question, he said, I am he. That they went backward and they fell to the ground. Uh, this is the most sure sign that tells us Jesus came not only for this purpose to die uh, in, on, on the cross for our sins, uh, but he went there willingly. Uh, don't ever doubt his control over all things or his love for you. I want you to see that very, you know, think about this. When Just when he spoke the word, every one of them fell backward and fell on the ground. Who was in control? Jesus was. He had all power. He had all authority. 
He, has, he still has that power and authority today. There is nothing that, uh, that is not out of his control. Uh, we may see things in this world that's out of control. We may see things that's in our nation that's out of control. We may see things in our life that's out of control. But rest assured, there is nothing out of the control of God. He is at, he is at work. Uh, he is in control. There is nothing that is perplexing him. There's nothing, nothing that is stressing him. There's nothing that's worrying him. He has got everything under control. And one of these days, all of the things that are spoken in the word of God are going to come to fruition. We might not understand where we're at. We might not understand what we're going through. We might not understand why the things are the way they are. But I'm telling you for sure that God's word is true and God's word will come forth exactly like God has spoken it to come forth and, and we will win. We that have put our faith and trust and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we will win. We'll have an eternity with the Lord God, with the Lord Jesus Christ. That you can rest assured on today. And speaking of being in control of all things, uh, this goes along with that. I was reading a book the other day that was talking about God and, and talking about him as creator and sustainer. Not only did he create, not only did he make everything that is seen, that we see him under, understand, uh, and he did it from nothing. He didn't have materials. He didn't order up materials. He, he did it from nothing, from the spoken voice, from his own words. Everything was created. It was in, put into existence. Uh, and those, uh, not only was he the creator, but he is the sustainer. He's the keeping hand that keeps everything at bay. You know, we've got evil in this land. There's no doubt. There's evil in this world. There's no doubt. We have an enemy whose name is Satan. He is out to kill and to destroy each and every one of us. He's out there. But I want you to know when we are saved, when we're born again, when we're in, uh, uh, when our sins are underneath the blood of Jesus, when we have following Jesus, when we're walking with him, the devil can do nothing. There's nothing, there's no power that's given to him that he has control over you. Even if we look at it in this context, even if we take our last breath, even if we die in this life, we know that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We know that even if we die in this life, that we have a new life if we're in him. We have an eternity with him. But the author pointed out many that believe, believe God, uh, it, sometimes they believe that he's just the creator. And there's some that refuse in this world that refuse to even believe that God was the creator of all things. But the proof of his love toward us is that he is also the sustainer of life. For that part, the book and the author wrote about it, if God did not care and if he did not love us and if he didn't uh, not, if he just created and didn't sustain us, if he just left everything to its own, if he was not sustainer, our universe would collapse in chaos and it would disintegrate in a matter of mere seconds. This world and everything is in it and this universe and everything that is in it is sustained by the spoken word of God. The scripture tells us of his power to create and to sustain. In Psalm 33 and 6 it says, By the word of the Lord were, were the heavens made and, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Hebrews 1 and 3 tells us who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things, listen to this, all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus has all power and all authority. I was praying the other day and I began to unleash some of my woes, I guess, unto the Lord. But then through the process of praying, it turned out that, that I began to say, I know you have all power and nothing happens that you don't already know. And no human uh, force, uh, separate or collective, could remove your power. 
No demons in hell, no, not the devil. Nothing can remove his power. Uh, and the devil and, and the demons, they, they tremble at his name uh, uh, alone. They flee at the sound of his voice. Uh, and they are silent when they're faced with your presence. Uh, uh, you uh, are God most powerful. And no one or thing is greater than you. Uh, and yet you loved us so much that you died for us. And you took our place upon Calvary. You took our place. You took our sins because you loved us. You have all the power that is ever is. You have all the glory. You have all the honor. You are God alone. And yet, as being God, you created a creature. Uh, you created man. And you created us in, in, the, in the form of, of yourself that you might have a relationship with us. And you loved us. Even when we fail, you love us. Even when we mess up, you love us. You are the God that gives us a love like we have never understood before. And somebody, as I said today, needs to know that Jesus loves you today. The scripture tells us in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In other words, God didn't condemn us right where we're at. He gave us an opportunity that we could come to him. He gave us an opportunity that we could repent of sin. He gave us an opportunity that we could say, hey, I, I need forgiveness. I need a savior. Forgive me of my sins and, and, and plead the blood of Jesus to cover the sins that we've committed. And then we follow him. You know, we don't just, just, uh, just don't keep saying, God, forgive me of my sins. I mean, he will forgive. He's a just God. He's a loving God. He's a merciful God. But we got to follow Jesus. Follow him in word. Follow him in prayer. Uh, follow him in all things that are of God. But getting back to Peter here just a moment. He was quite possibly dis disillusioned by the, the capture of Jesus. He just couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe the outcome. It, it bothered him. All his hopes, hopes of the Messiah that would happen, and when he came, they just vanished, and, and just immediately, just like that, instead of a, re, a, a, but instead of a refocus on Jesus, who caused him to walk on water. You know, he didn't stop to think. I don't believe he stopped to think a moment. Sometimes we're all like that. We don't stop to think. We. We just plow ahead. We misunderstand something. We don't understand something. We get hurt. Uh, things don't make sense. We just plow ahead. Nah, you know, done with it. Upset. But sometimes we need to refocus. We need to remember that, that Jesus was the one that saved us and forgave us of our sin. We need to remember uh, the word of God that maybe we learned as a child. It may be somebody that listening today that, that, you know, has forgotten that. Maybe they've lived a life outside of following Jesus and they, they've lived a life of sin. Maybe they went away from the Lord. Maybe they backslid on the Lord. Some, somewhere, somehow, you've heard the gospel. You've heard the name of Jesus. You believe there's a God. You believe there's a, a, a Jesus, but... Have you come to him and asked him to forgive you of your sins? Have you come to him and asked Jesus to live in your life? Have you come to him and said, Lord, I want to follow you in your word. I want to follow you daily. I want to live for you. Because just knowing who he is doesn't save you. It's coming to him and repenting of our sins and then following him that saves us. So we look at this today and he was disillusioned. Peter was disillusioned. All, you know, everything was lost. He didn't remember the one that Jesus caused him to walk on water. He didn't remember the Jesus that, 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 that fed the multitudes. He didn't remember the Jesus that healed the sick. He didn't remember the Jesus that healed the blinded eyes. He didn't remember, and, and even talk about sickness. He don't even remember the, the fact that he, Jesus healed his mother-in-law. He doesn't remember any of these things. He doesn't remember the demons that were cast out. He doesn't even remember. He saw the dead raised back to life. He saw all of these things. He 
didn't even remember when he was on the boat and Jesus said, peace be still. And the winds and the seas, they stopped. And all of them marveled and they said, what manner of man is this that even the, the winds and the seas obey his voice? He didn't remember all of this. He was disillusioned. They'd taken Jesus. This should not have been that we thought he was going to set up the rule of, uh, in, in the kingdom of Israel once again and restore all hope to Israel. Is this, this just didn't happen. He couldn't believe it. His focus was only on Jesus being captured. And it caused him to be distant. Matthew 26 tells us this. It said, and when they laid hold on Jesus, they led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off into a high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end, what was going to happen, in other words. Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. Matthew 26 goes on to say, in verse 69, it says, Now Peter sat without in the place, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out of the porch, another maid saw him and said unto him, That, there, that, that was there, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came, came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. And they, then he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew, or the rooster crew, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out, and he wept bitterly. Peter went from eyeing Jesus at a distance. Got to keep it safe. I don't want to get captured into this. Jesus is captured. Who knows what they'd do to me if they captured me? He went from eyeing Jesus at a distance to denying him before others. Now, there was nothing left but the tears. He wept bitterly. The Bible tells us this. He, he, it made, he was mad at himself. Have you ever been mad at yourself that you failed? Sometimes maybe maybe friend or, or backslider, maybe, you, maybe you've went out and you wept bitterly because you failed God, because you went back on God. Maybe you went away from God and, and, and you feel so upset at yourself. You're so aggravated that you keep slipping or you keep making the same mistakes. There's hope this morning, this day. He was mad at the world. He could not reconcile what he saw versus his faith. He couldn't reconcile the two together. He didn't see what Jesus was trying to do. So he goes back to the only thing he knows, work, survive, make a living. He goes back to fishing. That was, he was a fisherman by trade. So that's exactly sometimes what happens to us. We, when we slip up, when we fail God, when we mess up, there's a lot of times there's that temptation to just, I'll oh, just give up, just go back, do whatever you were doing. Uh, you know, the devil will come around and, and he makes it say that think it, that it's you. Uh, and maybe you are thinking these thoughts, well, I'm no good. I can't be saved. There's no hope in me. Uh, there's, there, God can't fix me. God can't help me. God can't use me. Whatever the case may be that the enemy is attacking you with. I want you to know, just like he was doing Peter, he, he may be doing you today. And you go back and you just work and you're existing, basically. You're living, you're working, you're doing whatever it is you want to do in this life. But there's no real joy, there's real, no real hope, there's no real life uh, moving inside of you. Maybe today you're in a spot where your faith was tested and you didn't understand the outcome. Are you still walking with Jesus? 
Or like Peter, are you observing at a distance? Maybe you've denied him and you've walked away from him. And, uh, and you knew uh, that if you walked away from what you know is real, if Peter didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ, would he have wept over the denial? I, I don't think so. If, if he had a, he, I believe he really genuinely understood and knew that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. If you're a sinner and there's a longing in your heart, a desire, there's something that's there that, that it, it's not going to go away. This world has never fixed. Uh, you may have tried most of everything that's going on in the world. Nothing has fixed that longing, that desire, that, that place of emptiness. But until you come to Jesus, you'll never be truly satisfied. Uh, you'll never have true joy. You'll never have true peace. You'll never have uh, real love in your heart until you come to Jesus. Backslider, like Peter, you may have uh, believed something caused you to, uh, and, and something took, caused you to take your eyes off of Jesus. Uh, an outcome didn't make sense. You know, uh, your focus was on the problem, not the problem solver. Uh, and I want you to know, it, it, you know, it could be that maybe somebody died and you prayed that they live and, and, they, and they died. And, and, and maybe you're angry with God. Uh, maybe there's a job that you wanted you didn't get and you're angry with God. Whatever the case may be, you need to get your eyes off your problem and get your eyes upon God today. Uh, because he's right there where you left him. Christian, now is not the time to lose sight of Jesus. It's not the son, it, it, he's our soon coming king. I believe he's coming sooner than we could ever imagine. Even in the midst of chaos and disease that we're seeing today, uh, corruption, lies, ungodliness, and perversion of this day, do not become disillusioned. Do not become disheartened or discouraged. You may find yourself weeping bitterly because you miss Jesus if you do. Hebrews tells us this, chapter 3, verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you of an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation. The provocation is a talking about the children of Israel who continually provoked the Lord to anger in the wilderness because of their unbelief, their doubt. But this is not the end of the story. No, Jesus died on the cross after, after uh, Peter denied him. He died on the cross, just like he said, and he arose from the grave in a glorified body, meaning that, uh, that there's a body that will never die again. His body was eternal. Uh, and before he ascended back to heaven, he appeared to many of the disciples. And uh, the Bible tells us for a witness that he was alive. One of these appearances of the disciples we find in a conversation with a confused and disillusioned Peter. John tells us this in chapter 21 of the book of John, verse 15, it says, So when they had died, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved here because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Jesus appeared on on the shoreline and they were fishing and he called them over and said there was bread and fish upon the fire he told them to come and dine and after they had eaten here here jesus has this conversation he gets him i believe it's just him and peter alone you know maybe they'd all fellowship they'd all had talk 
talking time. They'd all had a good time together. It's just like old times before Jesus went to the cross. Maybe it was much like the night that they had the Last Supper. Uh, probably a lot of talking going on, a lot of excitement going on. And, and, and you know, because like I said, they were disillusioned. They didn't realize that Jesus was going to die on the cross, even though that he had told them, them so. And here they are talking again. But I believe at some point he gets Peter alone. And he asks him, Peter, do you love me? And he does this three times as we just read. And, and Peter's like, yes, I love you. Lord, you know I love you. And, 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 and basically what, what notice Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Because that's the only possible question you, me, and the world must answer this question. Do you love Jesus? Do you believe upon his name? Will you repent of sin? Will you follow Jesus regardless of what happens in your life or in this world? Do you love Jesus? Will you follow him? But there was one question that wasn't asked. And because there was already, there was already an answer, Peter didn't have to ask Jesus if he loved him. And you don't either today. Jesus loves you. He didn't have to. Peter didn't have to say, Jesus, you know I, I messed up. Jesus, you know I, I denied you, just like you said. He didn't have to go through the whole spiel of, of Jesus, I, I, just, I just messed up and all this stuff happened. And I, I, I just, you know, Jesus, do you still love me? He didn't even have to ask that question because Jesus loved Peter. And Jesus loves you. Romans tells it this way, Romans 5 and 8 says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. But maybe today you're like Peter. You're caught up in a world that's a mess. You're caught up maybe in your own personal problems or your own struggles. Maybe you're going through sickness. Maybe you're going through disease. Maybe you're going through uh, numerous other things that could be attacking you daily. And, you know, we think about, I think about my life and, and, and just with the COVID crisis, you know, yeah, it complicates my life. But, you know, I think about some of our young people, uh, you know, our college students, our high school students, our middle school students, our elementary school students, all of these students that are, you know, they're facing things that you and I didn't have to face. And, and their struggles are, are twofold almost because they don't understand maybe, uh, you know, or the weight of the, uh, you know, not knowing what the future holds, not knowing what to do, not knowing which direction to take. Uh, it, it's, it's hard upon them. And, and most of us didn't have to go through that. Uh, so they need our prayers. They need our understanding. And they too need to know that Jesus loves them. That's the purpose that they're here. That's the purpose that you're here. That's the purpose of every life that's been given on this earth is the purpose to know Jesus Christ and to know him as their personal Savior. Uh, but maybe someone hurt you. Uh, maybe somebody... Uh, is continuing to hurt you. Maybe somebody gives you uh, grief. Maybe uh, uh, you're disappointed. Maybe you're disillusioned. Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe the weight of all these things together is just weighing heavy on your heart and mind, and you, and you feel like there's no hope, there's no help, there's no nothing you can do. Uh, today, I would just say, turn off the news today. Turn off your social media, anything that distracts you from hearing the voice of Jesus say, I love you. Find a place, read your Bible, and then pray, and then see if you don't feel his love. Jesus loves you. He cares about you, just like he did Peter. Sometimes, like I said in this, in this today, I hope you've got out of one thing is this. We can't get caught up in life's uh, struggles and life's uh, ups and downs without looking to Jesus first. And sometimes he's our last resort. But if we leave him as our last resort, we'll be like Peter. 
We may be eyeing him from a distance. And the next thing you know, if we're not careful, we could be denying him to others. Church, let your light shine for Jesus. Love one another, serve him, have your hope found in Jesus Christ. 